deliver a Winnie Madikizela Mandela legacy lecture. The ruling party has dedicated a week of activities to honor her struggle and sacrifices during apartheid. She would have celebrated her birthday on September the 26th. President Ramaphosa and Mama Winnie became close in the months before her death earlier this year. Long live. Long live the spirit of Albertina Sesulu. Long live. Amanda. Dimadekwa. Riperi. Sanbona. Jumela. Locha. Comrades. Comrade David Makura, Chairperson of the ANC in our province. Comrades, leaders of our region here in Johannesburg, members of the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress, members of the leadership of the Women's League, the Youth League, Sanko, Kosatu, SACP, I greet you all in the name of the African National Congress. Comrades, I was told I wanted to wear a t-shirt to be like you for but I was told for it today I must behave like a lecturer and put on a tie. Comrade Debuham insisted or I must put on this tie so that's why Limpona Kiaperi tie Kasonda. I'm under the dictatorship, your comrade Debohang Maili. <laughs> Comrades, Le Kutwezi, Comrade Mbalula, sounding very educated this evening, <laughs> talking about the reconstruction development of the soul. Asa Huaka RDP. RDS. So sitting next to him, Karam Balula, so Rutehile and Mo. For the elections, they are making Comrade Balula to be so educated. It's wonderful. I extend my greetings also to Bombe Basia Paro, Bakereke. Lebom Mebasia Paro, by Women's ANC, Women's League. I also extend my greetings to the clergy who are here with us. Comrades, it's a real honor and a rare privilege for me to join you this evening to reflect on the life, the times, and the legacy of Mama Wini Matigizela Mandela, who was a titan of our liberation struggle, an activist extraordinary, a leader, a feminist, a patriot, a mother, a grandmother, and a great grandmother. She was a mother not just of her children, but she was also a mother to the nation. As the mother of the nation, she nurtured many people, provided guidance and encouragement, provided support and care at moments of greatest hardship and celebrated every achievement. This is the week Mama Wini would have turned 82 years. We remember her courage 
and tenacity, but also we remember her warmth, her love, her nurturing spirit, and her altruism. But for those who got the opportunity to meet her, they will also remember her very warm hugs. I was one of those who enjoyed the hugs from Mama Wini. If you never got hugged by Mama Wini, you don't know what you missed. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Born in a village in the Eastern Cape to parents who were both teachers, she developed from an early age an appreciation for the value of education which she retained throughout her life. Education was one thing that Mama Winnie always insisted on and encouraged many people to become educated. As a young child in the trans sky, her encounters with racism, racism that was present even in the small town of Bizana, bred in her an abiding hatred of injustice and discrimination. On moving to Johannesburg to study social work, she was confronted with the full extent of the apartheid system and where she was drawn into political activism. It was here that she saw most clearly the racist incidents she had witnessed as a child were manifestation of a process of dispossession, of oppression and exploitation that stretched back many centuries. They were part of a colonial undertaking that sought to seize the land and appropriate the labor of the indigenous people of our country, as well as that of imported slaves and those who came as indentured labor, all justified by the false ideology of white supremacy. The country into which she was born had been impoverished by measures such as the 1913 Native Land Act, which consigned the majority of South Africans to a fraction of our country's land, where 87% of our land and the most fertile part was given to a minority, and the majority was given 13% of barely arable land. Stripped of their assets and livelihoods, the lives of black South Africans were further devastated by policies that prevented them from owning businesses or entering into most professional fields. This is the South Africa that Mama Wini was born into. And these were the times that she lived in. As part of its efforts to condemn black people to eternal subservience, the apartheid state introduced Bantu education, which prepared them to be nothing more than hewers of wood and drawers of water. It is important for us to remember where we have come from. It is important as we reflect on the life of Mama Wini to reflect on what made her what she finally became. She was a person who was born into these types of circumstances and that is what made her what she was as she herself said so. This is a country that created the migrant labor system 
which she felt very acutely coming from the Eastern Cape. A migrant labor system which built vast dormitory towns on the periphery of wide urban centers to house the workers needed to fuel the expansion of the white economy. To confirm, to confirm with apartheid planning, or to conform with apartheid planning, families were forcibly removed from the land they had occupied for generations, land that they owned, going back generations, and entire communities were uprooted and taken to areas that were unknown, in, un, inhospitable, and areas where there was no economic activity at all. Areas without basic services, located far from amenities, these townships and shanty towns became sites of misery and deprivation. It was primarily the plight of the poor and the marginalized residents of these areas that moved Mamawini to enter political life. This is what made her to become what she finally became. Imbued with a deep and passionate aversion to injustice, in all its forms, it was during her time as a social worker at Baraguana Hospital in Soweto that she came face to face with the muted discontents of our people. She came face to face with the ill health of our people, their diminished life expectancy, and the squalor of their living conditions. Those who have documented her early years as South Africa's first qualified female black social worker tell us in what they have written of a woman who was as tenacious as she was measured, a woman who was as passionate as she was professional. She could have easily settled into a comfortable bureaucratic life where she would have earned a social worker's salary and lived a fairly comfortable life in a very nice house. But she was there with the poor in their homes, in the schools, in the clinics, and in the hospitals. Her political involvement coincided with the infusion into the struggle of ideas and energy of a new generation of young leaders. She was active in women's struggles in the 50s, becoming a recognized figure in the liberation movement. It was also at this time that she became smitten by love when she met the love of her life, Nelson Mandela. Their lives intertwined and they were meshed into one. She met the love of her life as she was already getting into political activism. And if you have not yet met the love of your life, and you are sitting here in this hall, you just have to look around, and maybe you will meet the love of your life yourself. I can already point out someone who's looking at you, my sister. I can already point out someone who's looking at you, my brother. This is where you could meet the love of your life. And as black people, having met and fallen in love, 
as they would say, hopelessly in love. They lived in dangerous times, but this also meant that it was being in love in a dangerous period. It was also a marriage in risky times, a marriage that was filled with threats of apartheid jails, detentions, death squads, exile. It was also meant, it also meant being a mother in trying times. Considered a threat by the apartheid authorities, she began a life that was characterized by extended periods of detention, extended periods of banishment and banning orders. This was a time when the apartheid system, fearful of the genuine aspirations of black South Africans, unleashed the most brutal measures against those who strove for democracy. In the wake of the Shopville massacre, it rendered all protest illegal and forced into prison all the leaders of the people who had not escaped into exile. Over the years, the repression escalated. Detention and torture were common. Many freedom fighters were executed. Others were assassinated. Still others disappeared without trace. Many of their families continued to live in anguish then, and some still live in anguish till today because they do not know what happened to those of their family members who disappeared. It was a time of states of emergency, the banning of organizations, publications and meetings, when black South Africans became the victims of a severe form of collective punishment. This was the world into which Nomzamu Winifred Matigizela was born, the world that shaped her views and firmed her resolve. This was the world against which she would rebel and which she would dedicate her life to overthrowing. She would not rest until the oppression and the exploitation that was visited upon her people had been ended. She would not rest until freedom and democracy reigned across the beautiful land that she called her home. We remember her today, but we also remember her bravery, we remember her courage, and we also remember her total commitment to her people. Even at the darkest moments, when repression was at its peak, she was often the one and only person who was willing and prepared to keep the name of Nelson Mandela and the name of the African National Congress alive. There was a time in this country when it was a criminal offense to talk about the ANC. There was a time in this country it was a criminal and arrestable offense to talk about Nelson Mandela. But Winnie, Mamu Winnie, was the brave soul voice who was prepared to go to jail just to hoist and to pronounce the name African National Congress. And we are grateful for her, for that bravery. Often, hers was a lone voice of resistance inside the country as successive waves of leaders were imprisoned, silenced, and forced into exile. Her fighting spirit was accompanied by a depth of 
empathy that is very rare. Mamuwini lived among the poor and dispossessed, advocated for them, stood for them, and was their voice when they had no voice at all. Until her passing earlier this year, she was one of the very few leaders who continued to live among our people in the township and determined that she would not leave the township. She was the one person who was able as a leader to be always present at every moment in our people's lives. Whenever our people were suffering, whenever our people were in pain, whenever there would be a disaster that visited our people, be it a flood, be it a fire, be it wind that had blown the houses of our people away, Umamuwini was always the first to be there. And we remember her for that. She was always there to support people during, yes, their time of disaster. Separated from her husband for nearly three decades, and often separated from her own children and grandchildren, she endured imprisonment and banishment with fortitude and defiance. Many would have been broken. Many would have had their spirit crushed. Many would have cowered down. And yet many would have run away. But she remained standing, brave, strong and forever ready for the next action. She suffered for the principles she held dear, for being an outspoken woman, woman rather, in a patriarchal world, for threatening the very foundation of racial oppression with her determination to see her people set free. For too long, she carried the wounds of her suffering alone. As we were forced to acknowledge, as we bid farewell to her, her healing from the deep wounds inflicted on her was incomplete. Mamuini continued to carry those very deep, bleeding and gushing wounds of what apartheid did to her. If we are to atone for our inability to heal her wounds, then we must do everything in our means to repair the hurt that still resides amongst our people. Because she carried the wounds not only her own wounds, but the wounds of our people collectively. On her back were scars of the wounds that were inflicted on our people. And it is in this regard that we say, because she carried those wounds, and in many ways she carried those wounds alone, we need to heal the nation because our nation still carries the wounds that Mama Wini carried on her back. Mama Wini was a woman of peace. She understood that peace is not merely the absence of conflict. It requires also that we end the violence of poverty, the violence of dispossession, the violence of hunger and the violence of severe inequality. It is this understanding that has guided our policies, our programs and actions over the last 24 years. 
It continues to be at the center of the work of our movement, both within the country and in the promotion of international peace and development. We have undertaken a deliberate program of social and economic transformation that has improved the lives of millions of our people. As a committed social worker, Mama Wini was among those who argued very, very strongly for a comprehensive system of social security that would support the most vulnerable in society. Central to this effort has been the provision of social grants for children, for the elderly, for people with disabilities, which now reach over 17 million of our people. If you really want to know the origins, the origins and one of the key authors of this social grant process that we have and the care that our government is demonstrating to millions of our people, look no further but look into the heart of Umama Owini Matigizela Mandela because she is the one who argued for it. These measures, comrades, have substantially reduced poverty and have in many ways met the basic needs of many of our people for housing, water, sanitation and electricity. It has created opportunities for black and women South Africans to advance in the economy and to improve the quality of lives of their families. According to statistics cited in a report by the Institute of Race Relations, in 2001, around 38% of South Africans were estimated to live in the bottom third of the living standards measure. By 2015, that had been reduced to 10%, which is a huge decrease. Yet, as Mama Wini was the first to point out, despite the progress that we have made as a nation, poverty and unemployment still affect huge numbers of South Africans. Our country is still among the most unequal in the world. As we acknowledged at the ANC's 54th National Conference in December, the country has not progressed as fast as it should have in the last few years. In fact, the last decade has seen many of the gains of the early years of our democracy reversed through state capture and corruption, a failure of collective leadership, policy uncertainty, and a growing distance between the people and their movement and their government. We have had to come to terms with the erosion of the values of the ANC and confront difficult questions about the quality and integrity of our leadership as the African National Congress. As a movement, we have acknowledged these weaknesses and are determined that we should learn from our mistakes. We are at a point where we say we must learn from the mistakes of the past so that we never repeat those mistakes ever again. We emerged from the conference with a clear mandate to build a social compact for growth, for jobs, and for fundamental transformation. It is a mandate to end corruption and strengthen our public institutions, ensuring honest and effective leadership in state institutions 
particularly our state-owned enterprises, departments of government, but also our municipalities, as well as agencies that serve the nation like SARS, the law enforcement institutions, as well as institutions like the National Prosecuting Agency. This is the mandate that we emerge from our conference with, that we should reform those institutions, reposition them, get rid of corruption, make sure that all these institutions serve the interests of our people and no other interest at all. <laughs> Comrades, we are now where we are, where we are. As we go on with the legacy of Mamuin, we are now in a position to accelerate the transformation of our economy and society and to make faster progress in improving the lives of our people. As we work to implement that mandate that we were given by our conference, we are driven by Mamawini's insistence that the interests of the poor must be placed first. This is what she insisted. And this, comrades, informs our ambitious plans. As we plan everything, we are seeking to focus on the interests of the poor. As we go on with our ambitious drive to attract investments from within the country and from elsewhere, as we mobilize various sectors of the economy so that we can create the greatest opportunities for employment which will have the widest social impact. We are driven by what Umama insisted on that pe put people first. It informs our preparations also for the forthcoming job summit that we are going to go to in just a few days, where social partners are expected to agree on a range of practical measures that will lead to faster job creation. It is for this reason, too, that we will soon be implementing the national minimum wage, which will improve the income of millions of low-paid workers some 6.6 .6 million low-paid workers in our economy will benefit from the minimum wage. And it is also for this reason, with her memory looming large behind us, that we've also introduced free higher education for the children of the poor, and that is why we've also started working on the National Health Insurance Scheme, which will ensure that there is quality health care accessible to all our people. With Mama Wini's memory looming large behind us, it is for this reason that in the economic stimulus and recovery plan that we announced a week ago, that we are redirecting spending towards supporting emerging black farmers. It is for this reason that we are going to be supporting township businesses. Yes, even here in Johannesburg, we are going to be doing precisely that. This is part of a broader set of immediate initiatives that aim to return our economy to a path of growth, but more than that, to ensure that it is growth that is inclusive and has a direct impact on the conditions of poor people in our country. We see an important role for investors, for business, as well as for labor, but also 
for community-based organizations as we drive economic growth. But at the same time, we also need a capable state to play a transformative and developmental role in solving some of society's most pressing challenges. <laughs> Comrades, we are seeking to build a social compact that will create the conditions under which more people will get to work, more small businesses will have opportunities, and more people will receive better services more consistently. This is the South Africa that we seek to achieve that Mama Wini fought for. This is the South Africa that she dreamt about. This is the South Africa that she wanted to see come into being. A South Africa that cares for its poor people, a South Africa that is compassionate, and a South Africa that is developmental in character and also in terms of implementing its plans. It is a South Africa where no child is doomed to an inferior education on account of being poor. It is a South Africa where no mother loses her life in childbirth because she is poor and lives in a rural area hundreds of miles away from the nearest clinic. It is a South Africa where no girl who is a victim of abuse is denied justice because she or her parents cannot afford taxi fare to make it to the court for her case to be heard. It is a South Africa to which we are all committed and which I am certain that we all want to see achieved. Throughout her life, Uma Muini was committed to the unity of the people of South Africa. Part of her being was about uniting the people of our country. She was committed to the unity of the oppressed, arguing that it was only through united action, putting aside whatever differences the apartheid state sought to create, that freedom would be achieved for all. Now, the other important thing Ubamuini was committed to was committed to, to non-racial unity. She was convinced that the best antidote to the vial of racism, to the vial of apartheid, was the achievement of a country that truly belongs to all who live in it, black and white. And today, when non-racialism seems to be receding to the back, Umamuini, her memory is bringing it back to us because she stood firm on non-racialism, on insisting that all of us, black and white, must be united. We all belong to this country, to this South Africa that belongs to all of us. And this is a project that we must all work very hard for. Umamuini was also remarkable in her ability to reach out across the boundaries of the past, to build bridges at both a personal and a political level with those who had persecuted and denied her. This is one aspect of a legacy that we are called upon to preserve as well as to advance. We should challenge the racism, the chauvinism, and intolerance that still lingers in our society. By the same measure, we must also challenge all the manifestations of patriarchy, 
which she had to confront throughout her life. Our work, and our work, comrades, is to build a non-racial, a democratic, firstly, non-racial, non-sexist society. But that must mean that we must radically improve gender relations in our country and say, down with patriarchy, down. It means that we must also improve the economic status of women. We must combat all cultural practices and social norms that discriminate against women, and we must ensure that the girl child receives every opportunity to succeed in the world. That those who still have this notion that men are better than women, we must relegate them to the dustbin of history because there is no such thing. It is critical too, at this stage in our history, that we do take decisive steps to end the scourge of violence against women and children particularly the apparent increase in instances of the killing and the rape of women in our country and say that must come to an end as Mamouini would have wanted. We must work towards a united South Africa that recognizes the injustices of the past and is firmly committed to fundamentally transforming our economy and our society. And we need to get to a stage where these are no longer just slogans. We must get to a stage where we put it into practical effect, where we practice the economic empowerment of those who were previously relegated to the back. Uma Muini was firmly also committed to the unity of the African National Congress. Repeat, unity of the ANC. That is what she was committed to. She understood that this was vitally necessary if the ANC was to remain at the forefront of the liberation struggle. Now, this question of the unity of the ANC is non-negotiable. We don't even want to stand by and negotiate for a kind of unity It has to happen. Whether we like it or not, the ANC must be united. It must be united like a rope. We must bring together and weave together the various strengths. We must bring together the strengths that our membership brings about, the strengths that are brought by the youth, the strengths that are brought by the women, the strengths that are brought by, yes, men, the strengths that are brought together, yes, by people of different approaches, persuasions, all these must be weaved together and create this rope of unity, which is the unity of the African National Congress. That is what must happen. Now, she understood this. She understood that it is only when the ANC is strong that we will be able to achieve great things. She despaired at any sign of division. She despaired at any sign of factionalism or conflict within the ranks of the movement and was deeply disturbed by the effect that the contestations for positions and resources had on the ability of the ANC to advance the interests of our people. 
She felt for it. unity must come first. The contestation for positions and resources must be relegated to the back and the unity of our people must be in the forefront because that is where the ANC would derive its strength. As the ANC prepared for the 54th National Conference, she was foremost amongst the elders of our movement who urged an end to disunity and called on all leaders to settle whatever differences they may have in the interest of the ANC and in the interest of the country. She was also foremost among those who celebrated the clear decision of our conference to make a decisive stand and break with the negative tendencies that had set in within our movement and to embark on the program of rebuilding, of renewal, and of unity. As we meet to honor Mama Wini, as we celebrate her legacy, we must reaffirm our shared responsibility to build the ANC as a more effective instrument in the hands of our people as a united movement of our people. We should work as one to restore the principles and values of great leaders of our movement who taught us the meaning of integrity, the great leaders of our people who taught us the meaning of honesty, the meaning of sacrifice, the meaning of service to our people. The National Executive Committee is in session right now. We have just come from that meeting. And in that meeting, comrades, I can assure you, the majority of the discussion is about unity, finding ways to unite the African National Congress. The discussion which has raged all day has been about how we can forge unity how we can make sure that whatever may be areas of difference can disappear so that we unite the African National Congress and the membership of the ANC. I can assure you, comrades, we are finding each other. We are on the move to unite the African National Congress. And that is precisely what we have spent the last two and a half days doing, forging ways of unity. And it was quite interesting because it was speaker after speaker talking about how we can extend hands to one another and forge unity. It was a joy. I wish you had been a fly on the wall to see the leadership of the ANC trying to forge unity and finding unity among themselves. Comrades, as we do so, there is no better role model than Umamui. It is up to us, it is up to you and me, individually and collectively, to pick up the baton of unity and renewal. The conference said we need to renew the African National Congress to make the ANC go back to being the great attraction of our people, to make the ANC go back to being the leader of society, to go back to being, to making the ANC the one that determines the agenda for our nation and to make the ANC the true parliament of our people. That is what Umama Wini has left you and I to execute. It is also up to us to pick up the struggle of radical economic and social transformation. We have set on a path 
as I was saying, of economic recovery, which has at its heart the interests of our people. It is our people who suffer when our economy flags. It is they who prosper when our economy flourishes. In honoring this great heroine of our nation, we will make good on our decision to confer on Umama Uwini Nomzamo Matigizela Mandela the highest order of our movement is it We are going to honor her by awarding Isitwalandwe to her because she is amongst those great leaders of our nation who not only sacrificed but who also provided great leadership in the darkest of days under apartheid misrule in our country. And it will be a fitting tribute to her when we honor her with this award. And this is going to happen. Comrades, we look to next year as a time when we will be going to elections. This is going to be an electrifying moment for us as the African National Congress because we are going to go into these elections as a united force. We are going to go into these elections united, stronger, wiser, knowing what our people want. We are also, comrades, finalizing the drafting of our manifesto. Now, we draft our manifesto not in the boardrooms, not in offices. We draft our manifesto by going through the length and the breadth of our country, talking to our people, getting to know what their needs are. That is how we draft our manifesto. Comrade Balula, as he leads our election campaign, and here in Gaute, as Comrade Lebohang Maile leads our election campaign, as they proceed, they are also proceeding to listen through the various election structures we have to the needs of our people. As we go door to door, we are listening to the needs of our people in terms of what they want their movement, their glorious African National Congress to do for them. Glorious African National Congress. Because it is a glorious movement. Our people are drafting the manifesto that is now in draft form that is going to be launched at the right time. And Comrade Balula, at the national level, as he leads our election effort, we're listening to our people. And Comrades, I can tell you, the, net, the coming election is going to be an election of all elections. The mother of all elections, they will see what the ANC is going to do. Because the African National Congress will be going into those elections very, very ready. Our structures, our volunteers are getting ready, they are primed, and we are going to dazzle, we are going to surprise, we are going to show them what the ANC is all about as we get into that election. So comrades, I want you, yes, to get ready for that moment when the election date will be declared. I would like you to get ready. We must start priming our various structures and get them ready. And comrades, it will be good for us, yes, to run this election 
in the memory of Utatu Madiba, in the memory of Umama Albertina Sisulu, in the memory of Umama Uwini Matigizela Mandela. Those are the heroes and heroines of the struggle that we should run the election in memory thereof. We've just come back from New York, from the United Nations, where we were honored as South Africa. We were hugely honored by the whole world. The whole world honored us by agreeing that the life-size statue of Utata Nelson Kolishasa Mandela should be put in the precinct of the United Nations. Comrades, the image and the statue of the founding father of our democracy is in a few days going to be so well positioned. Comrades, Lindy Westisulu and the others are there now. When we unveiled the statue, it was in a particular setting. They are now going to move Madiba statue and put it at the entrance of the United Nations. So that whoever goes to the United Nations, if one day you become a tourist and you decide to go to the United Nations, as you go in, you will be welcomed by this great man with his hands extended welcoming you to the United Nations. You could not, comrades, there is no one else who is positioned like where Madiba is going to be. You could not wish to have a better place in the United Nations than to have the outstretched statue of Madiba welcoming everyone to the United Nations. What was also pleasing was to have more than 100 heads of government and heads of state speaking at the Nelson Mandela Peace Summit. We organized an all-day debate on peace and we dubbed it the Nelson Mandela Peace Summit. We had heads of state from all over the world talking about none other than Nelson Polishasa Mandela. It was a joy and a real pleasure for us as South Africans to bask, to bask in the wonderful words that were being articulated by the leaders of various countries in the world. We were overjoyed. And it was also a humbling moment. Humbling because this was the world saying, South Africa, we look at you as a beacon. We look at you as a country which upholds the best of human rights values, the best values. We look at you as a country that has the best constitution in the world. Comrades, South Africa was on stage. South Africa was being regaled by the whole world. You can be proud to be South African and we thank the world for that. Comrades, as I conclude, we have been, we are a fortunate people. We are fortunate because we've had great leaders. We've had great leaders who showed the way for us. We've had great leaders who have adhered to the values of our movement, the African National Congress, the Madibas of this world, Yes, the Oliver Tambo of this world. Yes, the Chris Hannes, the Joe Slobos, the Helen Josephs, Bumamu Petakmawa, and many others. They are the leaders who have shown the way forward. And today, as we remember Umama Uwini Matigizela Mandela, we are remembering her in the line of many other leaders who have come before her. And our job is to follow her example. Our job is to carry on
the work that they did. They have handed over the baton to us and all they ask for where they are today is to say, look after the African National Congress. Unite the African National Congress. Keep the ANC united, keep the ANC strong, and make the ANC successful, and make the ANC to lead the people of our country to prosperity, to lead the people of our country to true democracy, non-racialism, and non-sexism. That is what Umama Wini Mandela, it is us of us, it is not much to us of us, and that is all she wants. And with me here, I would say to Mamuini, yes, Mamuini, to Mamina, to Martina, we will follow in your footsteps. Thank you very much. Of course, that is a wrap-up of the Winima Dikizela lecture that has been taking place at Johannesburg Hall. Just the sentiments there from uh, President of South Africa, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa.